My wife and I would very much like to have been there for the 50th anniversary of the UCL astronomy department, but unfortunately our circumstances have changed and we can no longer attend. So I've recorded this video to show to the participants if you have time in order to let them know what I would have said if I had been there. So this is going to be very much an autobiography of my career as affected by the years I spent at UCL. Carl Sagan once said, astronomy is a humbling and character building experience. Now I've met a lot of astronomers in my time and there's certainly a lot of characters involved, though not that many humble ones. One of the things that astronomy does do for you is give you a distinct feeling of insignificance in the universe, which is probably very good for our ego. We are tiny creatures living on a small planet that represents only three millionths of the mass of the solar system. The sun is just one of about 400 billion stars in our galaxy, and there's estimated to be up to two trillion galaxies in the universe. Another thing is we deal with orders of magnitude, which tend to stretch the imagination. Sizes from subatomic particles to the entire universe. Time scales from picoseconds to 3.77 billion years, and that's just looking back over the history of the universe. We can project the lifetime of some stars forward 100 billion years. We deal with wavelengths from gamma rays to long wavelength radio, and even now gravity waves. And the neat thing is, if you study s some of these things, you can sometimes find people who will pay you to do it. I had two basic ambitions when I was young, and was unable to fulfill either of them, and that sometimes makes me feel sad even today. The first one was to become an artist. Now, in fact, I'd actually set my sights on coming here to the Slade School of Art, so I might have ended up at UCL, but just not in the astronomy department. The other one was to play cricket for England. Unfortunately, I got sick, and the illness I caught precluded me from achieving either of those goals. That illness was called amateur astronomy, and it became my all-consuming passion for the next many years. I once told a teacher that had asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, that I wanted to become a professional astronomer just like Patrick Moore. He patiently explained that Patrick Moore wasn't a professional astronomer, and if I wanted to become an astronomer, I'd have to go to university. Nobody in my family had ever been to university, and most of them thought it was a waste of time and money. However, I did well enough in my O and A levels to qualify for a position at university, and I noticed that UCL offered a BSc degree in astronomy. So what else could I do but apply? I did and was accepted. So now this was a dream come true. I was going to spend the next three years of my life studying a subject that I literally adored. So literally, I spent the next three years in heaven. As part of our course, I did a third year research project on stellar rotation. And that convinced me that I really wanted to go on and do more research in this subject. So I applied for a PhD course. But the question was, which of all the courses I'd taken over the last three years inspired me the most and that why I wanted to continue my studies in? Unfortunately, Dr. McNally, it wasn't spherical trigonometry. However, it was high energy astrophysics presented by Len Culhane. Not only did I find the coursework fascinating, but the energy and enthusiasm with which Len presented the, his lectures uh, was infectious and uh, very much reflected my own feelings about the subject. So I applied to the Mullard Space Science Lab to do a PhD in high energy astrophysics. This was perfect for me because it's a manor house out in the middle of the Surrey countryside and I'm a country boy at heart. I come from a small village just outside Exeter. I started working in the field of astrophysics but quickly transferred to solar physics. As part of that I got to go to Australia twice to launch sounding rockets. Now remember Space Nut and uh, Astronomy Nut getting to launch rockets that actually went up into space this was another dream come true. Unfortunately, neither of the rockets worked. However, at the time, I had no idea what a fundamental these rockets would have on the rest of my life and the rest of my career. The first of these rockets was called Skylark 1302. It was designed to get X-ray spectra from solar active regions. It was in collaboration with the Lockheed Solar and Astrophysics Lab from Palo Alto, California. Now, as part of this collaboration, I got to know the head of that group, Dr. Lauren Acton, very well. Now the, the payload itself worked just fine. The problem came from the rocket, which didn't point at the sun, which is rather detrimental when you're trying to get solar data. So when it failed, Lauren Acton invited me to come to Palo Alto to analyze some very similar data that they'd got from a couple of Araby flights. I had to think long and hard about that, maybe a microsecond or two, before uh, saying yes. So I spent much of the next three years out in California analyzing their data as a consultant to Lockheed. Now you have no idea how much money Lockheed pays consultants. I suspect I was earning more than Len was while I was out there. 
But that had an effect that I could afford to save up some money so my fiance Yvonne and I could get married. And next year we celebrate our 40th wedding anniversary, which is a pretty profound effect on one's life. Also, this instrument was proposed as part of a payload to go on the Solar Maximum mission. So now as part of a major on-orbit satellite uh, program. And that was very, very exciting indeed. The second rocket was called Skylark 1305. It was a UV spectrometer to measure helium coronal abundance. A very important number. But even though the, the payload worked just fine, the parachute failed to open. And when you drop your data from 120 miles up onto rocks in the Australian desert, you don't have a lot of data left to analyse. However, we proposed it as a prototype for Space Lab 2, which is a shuttle mission. And as part of that, they needed scientists to become payload specialists, i.e. scientists to become astronauts. So guess who volunteered? There were 1,200 applicants for the position, and I made it into the last 10. You can see my photograph at that interview in Huntsville, Alabama, uh, next to the shuttle. Uh, you might notice that fashions have somewhat changed in those last uh, 40 years. The medical exam in Houston did not go so well for me because I managed to break their strength machine, uh, which is somewhat ironic for somebody called Strong. And um, they had a test to see whether you would panic under stressful situations. And I was so bored with it, I actually fell asleep. So I was not selected, but Lauren Acton was, which left a Lauren Acton sized hole in his solar maximum mission team. But he had this consultant that he'd been working with for the last three years. So he hired me to work on the Solar Maximum mission, and this launched my career in the United States. Brief summary of my US career. In 1979, I became a data analyst on the Solar Maximum mission. By 1984, I was the principal investigator on the US part of the Solar Maximum mission instrument that I talked about earlier. In 1989, I became the solar uh, coronal group leader at the Lockheed Solar and Astrophysics Lab. In 1995, I became a manager of the Lockheed Martin Solar and Astrophysics Lab. In 1999, senior manager at the Lockheed Martin Advanced Technology Center, which meant I was in charge of three groups and uh, 220 scientists and engineers reported to me, which is where I got most of my gray hair. In 2001, I became an acting director at Lockheed Martin Advanced Technology Center. And in 2009, I retired and I do a lot of EPO work, education and public outreach work now. Uh, talking to schools and astronomy clubs. I volunteer at the NASA Visitor Center when needed, and I also uh, run a Twitter feed and a YouTube channel. Here's a sample of some of the instruments that I've been involved with the building of since I was at Lockheed. I'm very proud of this record uh, because pretty much any image of the sun you've seen in the last uh, 20 years was probably taken by one of our instruments. Now, the one instrument here that hasn't flown yet, and I'm looking very much forward to getting data from it, is the JWST NearCam instrument. Of all the instruments we built, the one I'm most proud is not one that looks at the sun, nor one that looks at the stars, but one that looks down at the earth. It's the GOES Lightning Mapper. I helped persuade NOAA to fly this instrument on the latest series of GOES spacecraft. And what it does is it images individual bursts of lightning from cloud to cloud and also from cloud to ground. So it takes images every one thousandth of a second to do that. And the intensity of these strikes tells you uh, whether there's a danger of uh, a lightning storm a long time earlier than was ever possible before. The other day I was playing golf and I was called in by the uh, uh, warning system on our golf course. And when I came in and looked at the images on the television, it was images from my instrument that was actually uh, causing the alarm to come. So this instrument is out there saving lives as we speak now. And that makes you feel particularly proud. Modern society is becoming more and more dependent on science and technology, but I fear less and less able to understand it. Thus, I think it's very important that universities put out as many people as possible with at least some background in science and preferably science degrees. Of those, I think astronomy degrees are very important because it gives you a unique perspective on the universe. It also is a subject that interests most of the public 
everybody's interested in stars and planets and galaxies and space travel and things of that sort. So you can use the principles of astronomy to illustrate modern scientific issues without people glazing over just because you're talking about science. So happy 50th anniversary UCL Astronomy Programme. I wish to personally thank you for the long and stimulating career that I've had in science uh, that I can trace directly back to the years I spent here at UCL and hope that you continue to educate and enthuse future generations of young people into this marvellous uh, subject uh, for many, many generations to come.